Welcome to Content Disrupted, bold takes on brand marketing. I'm your host, Casey Noble, and together we'll explore what it takes to excel in brand marketing at one of the most exciting and disruptive times in industry history. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Content Disrupted, bold takes on brand marketing. Joining us today is Tamsin Webster, founder and chief message strategist at Find the Red Thread. Tamsin honed her trademark Red Thread approach, working with major organizations like Johnson & Johnson, Harvard Medical School, and Intel, as well as with hundreds of individual founders, academics, and thought leaders. In addition to being a global keynote speaker, she's been named one of the top 30 management thinkers to watch by Thinkers 50 and authored the book, Find Your Red Thread, Make Your Big Ideas Irresistible, which I encourage everyone to pick up and read. I'm excited to dive into the Red Thread theory with you today, Tamsin. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, Casey. So I am a big fan of your method and how it applies, especially to our world of brand storytelling. That's where we really play at Skyward and sort of the focus here with a lot of our marketing audience. So for anyone who doesn't know or isn't as familiar with it, can you briefly explain what the Red Thread is? And I'm really curious why you felt so important to articulate this theory and method, especially, you know, now over the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. So another way to think of a red thread is a core story. It is the connection of ideas that make something make sense in our heads. And we all do this naturally. And when it comes to our brains, that story that we built is really just how we establish, you know, it's the relationship between cause and effect. This happened because this happened, or this will happen because this is true. And Since a lot of times we're trying to figure out how to make our point of view, our products, our services, our offerings make sense to other people, I had this, my hypothesis was that if we could explain it in the form, in the structure of a story, that it would automatically make more sense to people and it would be easier for them to see if and how they align with that idea or that approach. But it wasn't clear to me, I'm like, from what I could see, there wasn't really any research on what those unconscious brain stories consisted of, like what were the elements of those stories. Uh, So I had another idea that I decided to test, and that was, well, I wonder if the stories that we tell other people, kind of the once upon a time stories, classic three act structure kind of stories, do those have the elements they do? because they are how we make things make sense. In other words, did we make sure that those stories have those elements, like establishing something somebody wants but doesn't yet have, a a problem that they didn't expect, a moment where they realize the true nature of everything, a decision about what to change and how, and then how that actually plays out, was that actually what our brain needed? And so about seven years ago, I started playing around with that. And the red thread method, the red thread theory is what came up. It's it's that explicit explanation using story structure to help recreate our unconscious story structure that makes things make sense. Love it. So it's really from a marketing standpoint, how almost like the science and psychology, it seems behind making connections, right? Helping your audience make mental connections. Yeah. I mean, and I think it comes into play in all sorts of ways from a marketing or branding perspective, because you know, at the at the core story level, really what it is, is a, is a narrative presentation of why you do what you do the way that you do it. It's It's how you connect what you do with what your audience fundamentally cares about. And that's important because oftentimes what happens in brand and message, uh, marketing messaging is that we leave out actually really important parts of that message. And so we make it harder for our audiences to understand. For example, it's pretty classic to say, hey, you have this problem, use our solution. But the structure of story tells us that sitting in between that problem and solution is what's called a moment of truth. Aristotle called it an anagnorisis. There's this extra piece of information that somebody has to have that really makes them go, oh, that's why I have to have it. And it isn't just another benefit. It's basically something that says, okay, well, if I want, let's say this flower vase, right? And you know, I need to articulate the fact that 
flowers make my house more beautiful. And therefore, if I buy this flower house, my house, the flower vase, my house will look better. It's that extra little piece of information that people really need in order to make a message make sense and to make it work. So can you walk us a little bit through the method itself? So, you know, when you're working with an individual or an organization and they're struggling with their story, you know, what's typically, let's say they have no exposure to this, they're starting from scratch, you know, what's, where's the starting point? How do you lead them on this path of discovery to, to articulate and discover those moments? Sure, absolutely. So the thing, one of the ways to think about this is that a product, a service, an idea that you're trying to get out there really serves as the, in a lot of ways, the conclusion of this mental story, right? You, so whatever product or service that you're trying to get out there, whatever brand message you're trying to get out there is really where you want you know, the main character of the story, your audience, your potential customers to end up. You want them to choose that thing. So if you think of that as really the resolution of the story, then what we want to do when you're thinking about this is back all the way up and say, okay, if that's where we want our audience to end up is saying, yes, I understand. I agree with this approach. I agree that this is going to solve my problems and all of that kind of stuff. We have to back all the way up to where stories start to figure out what mental steps will someone have to take in order to reach that point. So where that starts is where every story starts. And every story, whether it's no matter what type it is, starts with you know, really the action starts when we understand that the main character, whoever that might be, wants something that they do not yet have, that they actively and knowingly want something that they don't have. So you can look at really classic films like Wizard of Oz and, and Dorothy wants to be someplace other than home at the beginning, right? Like that's where she's trying to do. So first step, you're talking about establishing that core story, that core goal statement, that message, right? What's sort of the next step beyond that I mean, activating? Yeah. So once you've established, really it's half of your core message and it's the start of your core story, that question the audience actively and knowingly is trying to answer, you know, that's their known problem. And then you can introduce something that they don't know about. And so that's, I call that the problem. So the first step is the goal, the audience's goal and the problem. It's a two-part problem generally. And what that represents is the quote unquote real problem that a lot of you know, sales and pitch advice and marketing talks about. Like what's the real problem you're trying to solve? And I think that understanding it from that perspective, that it's a problem that has to be solved before they can solve the problem that's represented by the goal, right? Because if I want something I don't yet have, I want to get away from home and I don't know how, right? Like there's got to be something else that gets in the way. So we need to do that next. And generally with business messaging, that's introducing I like to look at it as a problem of perspective, meaning that it's your audience as we need to think of them as smart, capable, good people. They have been trying to answer this question of the goal on their own. So we're trying to think about, well, why has it been a struggle for them to answer that question? And so where do you see sort of, you know, differentiation playing a role in this? So, you know, let's say there are several brands solving the same or similar problems, Obviously, you can stand out by being a brand who goes through this process to really understand the audience and make sure that their messaging is relevant and therefore will hopefully resonate more and connect more with the folks that they're targeting. But beyond that, how do you coach brands to understand how they can stand out among others who are solving the same problem that they do? Yeah, in certain ways, it's a little bit counterintuitive. And really, there's two ways right off of the bat. The first is to actually be clear about that goal question and make sure it's relevant to the audience. And here's what I mean. A lot of companies, a lot of brands skip straight to the real problem in an attempt to differentiate. But if we're most of us are going to be familiar with the classic marketing funnel, like people have to be aware of you before you're going to move into a consideration set. And so you have to establish with the goal, if you're clear on that, that's going to establish a clarity and relevance that puts you in the consideration set that because so many brands skip it, a lot of times separates you just right there, right? But as you point out, there may be other companies that solve you know, or answer that same goal question. So 
a lot of times it's really in that articulation of what the real problem is and the next step in that red thread process that really is where you start to stand out and differentiate from your audience. Again, it's not so much how you solve it as why you solve it that way. Now, sometimes you are going to differentiate on that change that you represent, right? On that resolution to the story. Oftentimes, and I've got a lot of clients that do have truly novel solutions, but a lot of times, like if you're a service professional, like, well, what's the difference if you're, you know, one financial advisor to another, or, you know, I've worked with electrical manufacturers in the past, like, okay, well, what's the difference between your spark plug and that person's spark plug. And a lot of times it's only in that articulation of what problem you think actually needs to be solved. Let's say, you know, hey, we're focused on the initial cost of something, if we're talking about an electrical manufacturer, instead of the lifetime cost of something, right? So this pro product or this, you know, commodity piece may be cheaper in the get-go, but if you have to keep replacing it, it actually isn't going to save you money long term, right? So by saying, okay, that's a place that we're differentiating. And rather than just saying we're more reliable, it's actually making the case that you can't get the thing that you want long term unless you solve this problem that we solve. Essentially, we're saying, yeah, we're going to help you with your spark plug or product, but we're actually going to so help you solve this reliability problem right? That's actually driving part of the issue that you've got in the first place. The second place is in that thing that I mentioned before that a lot of messaging skips, which is that what I call the truth, the, the additional piece of information that really sets your piece apart, right? Because other folks may say, yeah, okay, fine. We're also focused on reliability. We're also focused on lifetime value of the product. But it's on the next one that where, again, there's going to be some deep-seated principle of the organization, some operating assumption that the company has about why you solve reliability in your particular way, right? So that could be that you put in additional research. That could be that you use different materials. It could be something else. But there is a reason why that for you is the best path to reliability. And when you articulate that as well, you are now really creating a deep understanding of not just what your product is, what your change is, and you know how it's differentiated, but you're explaining the why behind the how, which again, because so many people skip yeah, like not only are you going to make it clear why you're differentiated, but that why behind the how is in and of itself differentiating because fundamentally people will align not just with your product, but with the approach that you take to thinking about it. And so to me, that's part of the reason why it can be so powerful as an approach to like when part of the question you're trying to answer for your own brand is how do we differentiate? Yeah, I think that's a great point. It almost seems like it's so rare, right? Like, as you're saying that within the market, any given category, you're the one people will respond and say like, wow, that was so transparent. Wow. It's a landing page. I actually understand. Wow. It's talking to me instead of talking at me. <laughs> like, it's so refreshing, right? Yes. I mean, to use this own structure, like a lot of times when we're trying to differentiate, we rely, over rely on explaining where we think the differentiation comes from rather than arguing for our point of differentiation. And I know it's a subtle difference, but rather than saying we're reliable because we're high quality, right? You're really saying, well, we believe right? That it's the lifetime cost of something that ultimately determines how successful it is at solving the problem that you know you have. And we believe, right, that the greatest reliability comes from, you know, products and materials you can rely on. That's why, right, when we, in our products, we take, right, we do X, Y, and Z to make sure that our products meet this standard, et, et cetera, you know, and all of these things. And you see how that's different than just saying our products are better at this because they're higher quality. We're saying what makes them higher quality and why is higher quality part, like what aspect of best are you addressing with higher quality? And again, like that, we end up so much saying what we want to say about our products that we overlook what it is that people actually need to hear in order to understand. 
And they have to understand in order to understand whether or not it aligns enough with them for them to agree, right? And so what we end up doing is that as well intentioned as that might be, we end up asking people to make leaps of faith. We basically are saying, trust us that this is good enough to do what you need to do. And trust our testimonials, trust how long we've been in business, trust what it looks like, trust its price. Yes. I love it. It almost takes me back to, you know, like college or graduate school and some professors I had always saying like, you know, when you're writing, it's like, why does this matter? Keep going back to it. Why does this matter? Keep dissecting, keep unpacking the core question, the core topic. And if we just do that with discipline and in the audience mindset, you're digging a lot deeper and finding those true questions that need to be answered. Yeah. And you're ending up with things that end up being a lot more differentiating than just we're the best. We have high quality. We have X, Y, and Z. I want to talk about one of those challenges because, you know, one of the challenges that we see a lot of the time is, you know, reinforcing that narrative, right? So let's say, you know, you're leading marketing, you've done the work to, craft this really thoughtful narrative structure and like, here are the stories we need to, and the messages we need to go to market with. But then you have, you know, especially if you're in an enterprise organization, that message gets disseminated or, you know, needs to be practically speaking across channel teams, you know, maybe across a global organization. So, and you need a steady drumbeat, right? Things have to be, it should be cohesive. You don't want people misinterpreting the message or, going out with something hollow because, you know, on paper, it matches the slide deck. This is our brand messaging. Fly the friendly sky. Right. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> what, exactly. What's your advice for yeah. how to like meaningfully reinforce this practically speaking? Yeah. So I believe very strongly that it comes from that a, a lot of that can be solved with the message design process in the first place. A lot of times we think of brand messaging as the purview of marketing. And I don't believe it. I think true message design, message design of the organization sits at the intersection of communication strategy, product strategy, and business strategy. Because if those three things aren't aligned, it's just not going to work, right? So that means that we really have to think about what are the assumptions that are driving all three of those things in order to make them successful. So that's why with the, you know, when I'm working with clients and I've tried to make this as simple as possible, and I've spent the last 18 months actually finding kind of even a, even a faster way to find the, the underpinnings of, of the red thread so that we can get to that and solve a lot of these problems faster. And it does still start with saying, what is that question that you're trying to ask that, you know, I, I call that the core question, your organization exists or your, you know, a line of products exists to answer a question. It is the core. It is why you are there. If the people didn't have that question, your product, your service, your business wouldn't exist, right? Full stop. You need to know what that is. And then if we're trying to find, and I would argue we all are, the simplest, strongest argument for your approach, it's about saying, okay, if we took everything else away, like what do we believe is absolutely required to answer that question well. When I'm giving talks and trainings on this, I I often use, because a lot of us are familiar with it, the Apple iPod example. You know, so the core question that I would argue that the iPod existed to answer at the time it was released 22 years ago, 23 years ago, was what's a better way to carry my music with me, right? And you can think about 22 years ago, other devices, other services answered that same question. Radio answered that question. CDs answered that question. Walkman's answered that question, right? And the iPod exists because it would serve a, a, to Apple as a better and different answer to that question. So we can kind of reverse engineer because thankfully we have the product. We know how it was launched. We know its original tagline was a thousand songs in your pocket. And we can reverse engineer to the core elements that they really felt was important when answering that question. And I would argue that the first one is variety, that they said, hey, you know what the biggest problem is with all the other ways to carry your music with me is that the variety is limited. So back to that two-part problem, it's focused either on an individual's taste, meaning the DJ, 
or on individual albums because, or an individual tape, mixtape, right? You can't, that was all you could take with you. It was what would fit in the sun visor of your car. Um, it would what fit on a CD. It was what fit on a cassette. And so they're like, but we believe that when it comes to variety, the more of your music library that goes with you, the better. Or to really be super simple about it, when it comes to variety, more is more, right? So what's the core question? Hey, what's a better way to carry music with us? What is something that they believe to their core must be part of a better answer? Variety. Is that enough? Does that lead them to an answer? No, I would argue that you can't differentiate on one core element. You have to have two at the very least that gets into like adjacent possible and all sorts of good stuff like that. All right. So if we're saying, okay, if variety was one thing, again, let's think about the iPod. What was the other major element that they figured had to be part of the approach to solve that question in a better way? In your pocket, right? So we can think of it now as portability. So we had variety, we had portability. Why would portability be important as a core element? Well, because the more places you can take your music with you, the better, right? This is how I work with clients is to say, okay, what's that core question? And what are those two core elements? And yeah, you only get two. Why? Because the simplest, strongest argument, thanks Aristotle, is based on two principles. Because when it comes to variety, more is more. And because when it comes to portability, less is more. That's why we believe, says Apple, says I, reverse engineering, they didn't use this process, that the best way to carry your music with you is to make maximum variety as portable as possible. How? Then you go into the detail that we're all like, well, it's a 10 megabit like digital music player that uses X, Y, and Z in a proprietary system. But that's usually where we start. We usually say, oh, the iPod is best. And they didn't, thank goodness. They said it's a thousand songs in your pocket and our story brains filled in the rest. I love it. It's almost like clarify, right? Yeah. But again, it's clarify in a very specific way, right? It, and it really is coming down to like clarify the core principles that people already understand. So, you know, all of my work is based on answering a core question, like how do you build buy-in, right? Because whether it's marketing, a sales, business, strategy, whatever, everybody needs that. How do you build buy-in for an idea? And fundamentally, because every decision has this story behind it and the stories that we act on are based on beliefs that we already have, right? The whole philosophy behind this is that the best way to build buy-in is to build your core story, your core case, your core message, your core argument on beliefs that your audience already agrees with. Anchor it on a question they already have. Explain it through principles they already agree with. And because you're combining new things, old things in new ways, you are making something ultimately unfamiliar to them feel not only familiar, but completely aligned with how they see the world. I love it. I love the energy. I just keep wanting to say like, preach, preach, because it's still just so familiar and resonates so much. This is great. I wanted to ask you because you're also have studied very closely and experienced and led organizational change. So you talked a little bit about, you know, gaining buy-in and things like that. What are some of the other sort of stumbling blocks that you see with clients or organizations when you're trying to create this alignment across the organization, when you're trying to roll out, you know, this essentially like a mindset and way that we're going to go to market and rally people around this? Yeah, I had someone respond to my newsletter with a very similar question. It's like, well, why is it that people always ignore the best ideas? And this is, it was a great question because it's also, but that's the perspective that people have. It's the same thing. Why can't people see that this change is the one that we need to make? And my answer was that they're, you know, first and foremost, it comes down to understanding, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, the first thing, first way that that shows up is that you're just literally not giving people the information they need to understand. You are leaving something out and you can go back to story to give yourself a quick rule of thumb for what am I leaving out? And you're either leaving out the first act, you're leaving out the context. You are giving people an answer without the question. They need the question. Or you are leaving out the third act, the answer. We solve business transformation. How? 
that's a great example of you haven't given them the third act. And the one that I'm super passionate about, it can also happen if you don't tell them what happens in the middle. If you don't tell them why this answer is the right or best or a better answer to their question. Are you leaving out the second act? You know, Fitzgerald said there is no second act in American life. And I would say there's no second act in the vast majority of business messaging. We have to put it in there because a story, any once upon a time story does not make sense without it. If that moment doesn't happen in a story, the change won't make sense. Like whatever that person decides to do won't make sense. You won't understand like, Luke doesn't shoot into the channel of the Death Star for no reason. It's an impossible shot. What does he absolutely believe to be true in that moment? Use the force. That the force will guide the shot, right? Like that's, and unless that happens, that shot doesn't make any sense. You're like, why would, right? So that's a really good way is to say, do we have all pieces of this information? And it doesn't all have to be in one line, but in the, context that you are presenting information to somebody they have to be able to get like you know let's say over the course of an ad over the course of a website over the course of a conversation over the course of a presentation over the course of a campaign they have to have they have to hear information that represents all three parts and how they connect the second way is understanding is probably one that we're pretty familiar with is we are using language that people don't understand and that's either because it's too specific or too sophisticated or too like ours because we're trying to differentiate Oof. or it's so vague that people can don't even know what you mean by it. It's what you meant by transformation. What does that even mean? And I see people when they're like, well, we need to be authentic. What does that even mean? We're your strategic partner. What do you mean by that? Right. So we have to be super, super clear and very specific about those things. And then ultimately, like if either of those forms of understanding don't happen, you cannot get to the last, you know, the last major reason why people ignore good ideas or don't see a change. Is that because if you haven't given those pieces, they cannot know whether or not they align. They cannot know. If they don't know what the question is, they don't know why it's relevant. If they don't know what the answer is, they don't know what they're signing up for. If they don't know what those assumptions are, what the argument actually is, they don't know if they actually agree with you, right? So an example I'm literally writing into my manuscript of my second book right now is like, let's say everybody agrees in the organization that we need more innovation, right? And we need more innovation. That's the what, because of the why, thank you, Simon Sinek, because it's going to open revenue streams, keep us ahead of the competition, could be all sorts of things, but innovation, great, fabulous. Everybody's on board. And then senior leadership is like, why aren't they doing this? Well, if senior leadership believes the best way to achieve innovation is a separate lab, innovation lab, that's kind of sitting off to the side and the employees are like, dude, we want to do this. This sounds fun. We think it should be an operational mandate. If each side doesn't explain why they think that way is right beyond just it's better or it does this, the leadership has to explain what is it about separation that would lead to innovation? What is it about a focused lab that would open up new revenue streams? Just like the employees would have to argue, argue why operationally you know, operational mandates would lead to more innovation, why operational mandates would lead to opening new revenue streams. They have to make that case in order to have any chance of converting either side to the other. Otherwise, we're just devolving into positions. But principles, why you do what you do, are always stronger than positions. So if we can get those out on the table, then we can at least understand where the true resistance is to something. Because it will either be some form of, actually, we don't all agree that more, that more innovation is the best way to achieve this. Or actually, we don't agree that separation is whatever. Why not? And then you may open a whole can of worms. But you're going to open a can of worms eventually anyway. So my thought is like, let's just do it up front and take it and figure out what that is so we can really solve the problem that's going on. Right. Make the best choice. I love it. So these, I think this whole conversation will be a big unlock for folks because you're explaining how these fundamental principles and techniques can really be applied to your brand storytelling, your internal storytelling, your personal 
relationships and the way you communicate with others. It's kind of like ding, ding, ding. Yeah, the full spectrum. So I love that. I know I could go dive into this with you all day. I know we're at time, but before I let you go, are you game for a little speed round with some some rapid fire questions? Yeah. So I'll just ask you a few questions. You tell me what comes top of mind and you know, with your brain and your background, I think this will be really fun. So I'm excited about your answers. Or horrifying, but we will figure it out. Okay. So in your work, you know, as an idea strategist, what keeps you up at night? How to make this, all of this even easier. Like how, like it's just, you know, because the, the biggest friction to ideas getting out there is that it's hard. And so I've tried to come up with frameworks and processes that make it easier. I just, it's always like the easier it is, the more likely it will be to endure. And that's, so it's constantly, how do I make this clearer? How do I make it easier? Um, and that's where this whole kind of core case, core argument piece came from. Cause I was like, red thread, super strong. I know it is. How do we make it even easier? That, that keeps me up at night. And what keeps you going? Oh gosh, the opportunity. I mean, I just, so I'm a big believer in the more, you know, the more you can know. So I just like collect shiny ideas and then figure out like what I can build with them. So that's what keeps me going. It's just like this, just like what's next, what's next. So it's always just like, what else is out there? What else is interesting? What are people learning? What are people saying? Where are the problems? Where are the frictions? Because just kind of following all those rabbit holes, you just never know what you'll turn up and what unexpected connections you can make. I love it. Yeah. I'm so drawn to sort of like interdisciplinary thinking. And I feel like, you know, as a thought leader, that's really the key. I mean, within this conversation alone, you've brought in like Aristotle, brought in a little psychology, brought in some like business, cha- you know, some uh, business change management speak and organizational theory. And so that is the magic is like you make those connections for people, which is really special. But what marketing term do you love? I love mindset because I think it's underappreciated, but I think there's a lot to be said. And what I mean, my mindset is in the way that it's typically articulated, which is what is the point of view from which somebody is operating or, you know, whether that's the brand or whether that's the person, I think that the, that marketing that focuses on, on mindset and that, that that's one of the few places in marketing where I think that what people, what most people think it is, is actually what it is, which is probably why I like it. Versus other things where people are like, this is what it is. I'm like, no, it's not. Which gets just hijacked. And yeah, there's a whole conversation around that. Uh, What marketing term do you hate? I mean, I literally hate branding. Well, I would, it was that. I think I'm actually starting to kind of dislike positioning even more because positioning, and I know this is going to sound absolutely heretical, that positioning is too audience focused. (laughs) And I know that sounds really weird because it's basically, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, what position do we want to own in the mind of our audience? And how do we kind of shape this message in order to like fit that thing? And I'm like, this is how brands end up in, in, in problems. Because as, as we've been talking about, what I have seen over and over and over again is that the underlying beliefs, known and unknown of the brand, shape its behavior. And it's the behavior that shapes the brand, right? So ultimately, it's the beliefs, most, most of which brands are unaware of. Here's the sort of wild card question. What emoji best describes the current state of marketing? <laughs> Face palm. I get a lot of rocket ship. That's a sort of like, whoa, we got a lot to unpack and solve here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I say that for a couple of different reasons. One is having been like a, you know, a career marketer, like it is a hard job. I mean, they, the marketers are the translators of the organization and it is tough. They need to be higher up in the strategic conversations and they usually aren't. So, you know, they're the ones that are kind of both from a, and because they have usually just enough remove from those strategic conversations, unfortunately, they have enough objectivity that they're often like in face palm with like, oh my, are you really kidding me right now with what you're asking me to go out to the market with? And vice versa, I think that a lot of times they're looking at their audience and going, wow, okay, right? So there is a lot of that, but I think there is also a lot of, you know, just well-intentioned, but it just as often happens when it's a face palm, well, all of a sudden you're like, oh, Dang, right, of course, that I think there's a lot of things where, you know, I think we all suffer from you know, what I call the persuasion paradox, which is that we attempt to persuade other people through means that we would never tolerate on our own. And I put the blame for that not on the individual marketer, but on kind of the field of marketing in general and the unrealistic expectations that come from a true lack of understanding at the executive level of what marketing really is and can be about, which is you know, part of the reason why I was railing against positioning. So yeah, baseball. 
Serious food for thought there. And then I am curious, you just went deep. It's important though. It's a conversation. I think it's something that everybody kind of is living with and understands and feels, but isn't being brought into the light enough. What's your take on sort of that age old debate, quality or quantity? Quality. No question to me, because if you start with quality, you will keep your quantity. That's what I believe. And what happens when you go for quantity is that you're casting a wide net, but you're capturing a lot of people who aren't, aren't going to make it all the way through um, because they don't have the problem that you solve or they don't agree with your core principles. You know, they're just not your people. And so to me, it's, it's about doing right on uh, doing it right for the first time so that we, you know, all of us executives included don't have to spend so much time in a facepalm moment. Right. And there isn't so much inborn tension between we're not getting the right people. We're not getting enough. And it's like, generally it means we're not getting enough of the right people. So if we do that quality work in advance, we get more of the right people to begin with and we keep them more, which over time accumulates to a greater quantity of the right quality than a focus on quality, a quantity does at the beginning. I think that's a perfect way to close the conversation. Tamsin, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fun for me and I think enlightening for everybody who's going to be able to listen. For folks listening, we will make sure we have a link to your book and let us know when your next book is published. We can add that as well too. Very exciting to know that's in the works. Yeah, you can go to, it's we're having trouble sometimes on Chrome, but the URL is littlechangebook.com. So if you're interested in knowing when that new book comes out, it's going to be called Say What They Can't Unhear, The Nine Principles of Lasting Change. So and if you really want it, it's actually available for pre-order on Amazon right now. Perfect. Thanks so much. We got it. the secrets out. So thanks. It's really exciting. Thank you so much. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thanks for coming on the show. I look forward to it. Thanks, Casey. Awesome. Thanks for listening to Content Disrupted, brought to you by Skyward. Stay up to date on the latest ideas and insights in brand building and content marketing by visiting our website at skyward.com. Join us for our next episode, where we'll continue to challenge marketing norms and inspire you with fresh strategies for growing business through brand storytelling. See you there.